before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful hello it's monty here for this episode of on farm the food agriculture and rural matters podcast beautiful day to set off through the scottish borders on the first leg of our journey to the newcastle to amsterdam ferry In this episode, we're going to share recordings from a convoy of much-needed trucks being driven from Scotland and the rest of the UK over to Ukraine by a farmer-led charity. 23 vehicles have been delivered this week, and now we are going to be delivering our 140th vehicle filled with aid supplies, which are very gratefully received by the Ukrainians for help in both humanitarian and military efforts. This is Keith Dawson for Pickups for Peace. We'll hear more of the clips peppered through the episode. Keith Dawson is a Whale Kent face and voice for many in Scottish agriculture. He's a founder and organiser of the charity Pickups for Peace, and he's also a clever and trusted agronomist and has also had a long career with ACC Consulting. Keith also has a big connection with Ukraine. Before the war, he was part of a team setting up and running Europe's biggest regenerative farm. The war in Ukraine is very personal for Keith. A long journey ahead of us of about 1,800 miles, but a good committed team of local heroes driving across Europe to deliver help and moral support to the Ukrainians. This is an important and insightful episode, I hope you agree. But it's only made possible with the support of our on-farm sponsors. And I'm going to credit them all in this episode. Bail Ingram, Gillespie McAndrew, Laurie and Symington, massive thanks to you. We can only do things like this and speak to Pickups for Peace and other charities and promote their work because of our sponsors. We're actually standing here. We're in the Steading building near Cooper in Fife, and we're standing beside a pickup truck. We're standing beside a Mitsubishi L200, slightly elderly truck, but this truck has got a second life ahead of itself now, and this truck is going to be a lifesaver. Keith, you were one of the founders of Pickups for Peace. Tell us, where did it come from and what it's all about and what you've maybe achieved to date? Well, Mark Laird and and I, uh, uh, one of the other founders, have been farming in Ukraine for nearly 20 years, and... uh, We've been always impressed by the hospitality and the, the, the fellowship that we've had with the Ukrainians. So when the war first started in 2014, not 2022, we were horrified at what was happening and uh, we started our aid efforts then. Obviously, that was intensified in February the 25th, 2022, and we, we asked ourselves, what can we do? And very quickly, we started doing a number of things like providing equipment for the locals to help build uh, uh, roadblocks and, and uh, also supplied potatoes and, and uh, sea potatoes for locals because food is absolutely critical and farming is very critical to the Ukrainian uh, economy now, even more so since uh, uh, Putin has, has grasped all the, uh, the mining and uh, metal works over in, over in the east. So farming is very, very important and the land is very important to the soul of the Ukrainians uh, with the, the history that they've had of oppression and, uh, and, and genocides in the past. So we asked ourselves what, what could we do. So we, we continued and we donated with the help of Caledonian Marts in Stirling three pickup vehicles to help with humanitarian rescue wounded, rescue civilians and deliver supplies. Two, two of those within six months had been destroyed by Russian artillery in separate incidents. So we said to ourselves, we must try and replace these. 
And then I guess o o over, over a few uh, beers and, and discussions, we came up with this crazy idea of, well, why don't we just not just replace them, but why don't we go for 100 vehicles? A crazy pie in the sky idea, but we thought we would we'd give it a go and test the, the, the resolve and, and the um, uh, support of the, uh, the farming community. And wow, have we been surprised by the, the way it's taken off and, and the, the genuine uh, feeling and generosity of the whole farming and agricultural community in Scotland and wider afield. We have now left the ferry in Amsterdam. We have been very well received by the customs officials um, with thumbs up and even one motorbiker gave us a 20 euro uh, donation for diesel. Our journey takes us through the Netherlands, through Germany and into Poland uh, this evening. Uh, as we journey through with our vehicles and supplies in a, a convoys, groups of three or four, um, about 23 vehicles going through and we are meaning to go um, across Europe to Poland this evening. Initially we, we reached out to friends and family and then it, it got a, a momentum all of its own. Once we'd uh, taken the first convoy across of 25 vehicles back in, back in March. That was March 2023. Yes, that's yeah. correct, yes. Yeah. So those people who had driven on that had had such a remarkable experience, a whole emotional roller coaster in their trip across Europe uh, on the ferry and then driving across Europe uh, and delivering the Lviv, meeting the soldiers there, meeting the humanitarians there and seeing also the graves of the soldiers who'd been killed in the conflict. Um, th this remarkable uh, story and, and experiences spread. Uh, th these ambassadors from the first trip uh, carried that on. We had one young man who'd only had his license for six months and uh, he drove across Europe with his, with his father. Um, one of the first group from 18 years old to, to, to 75. Um, and he said, this, Keith, is life-changing for me. He then went back and raised enough money for another pickup and it's been on four of the, the convoys since then. So people have been very affected by this experience and it's um, something that's unique for people, I think. And it's, it's spread and uh, through various media and, and people like yourselves, uh, the word has got around and it's really tapped into, I think, a need uh, for the farming community in particular. People want to do something, but they don't know quite what to do. Some have taken Ukrainians into their, their homes, but here is a very tangible thing, whether it's putting some money in to buy a spade or a jerry can or providing a vehicle or putting money in towards a vehicle. Um, it's not very often in, in the, the farming community we get the chance to save lives, but these are saving lives in a very real sense. And I think um, even if one uh, vehicle, a vehicle it saves one life, you know, uh, we're now at the stage where we've got 160 vehicles have been delivered. That's 160 Christmas tables where there will be somebody at that table who wouldn't have been there otherwise. And these vehicles are, are each saving far more than just one life. And we hope that those, uh, uh, the efforts that we've had here and the supplies that we're providing will save many more lives in the future. So we're now at the Ukrainian border, our 23 vehicles uh, are all assembled uh, and through the Polish border uh, with the help of the local mayor and uh, to the Ukrainian border now where we will travel under police escort, everybody along the roads, uh, giving their respects and pulling over and uh, as we go through the villages to deliver our vehicles to Lviv, um, a city uh, of a million people, a beautiful city, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. We travelled across Europe, only one of our vehicles broke down and uh, no one is left behind on these journeys so the team got together and towed it and got the, the, the vehicle fixed and uh, it continued on its way. Um, the great esprit de corps amongst these teams that we've had across in, in our, what is now our fifth convoy is a joy to behold. Everybody getting on from 18 to 80, driving across Europe, delivering these vehicles to save lives, uh, which they do on a regular basis, uh, working with the humanitarian organisations and the military to uh, rescue villagers, rescue the wounded, and uh, uh, mine clearances, um, drone uh, squads, uh, and also um, 
supplying uh, medical supplies throughout uh, the areas that need them, particularly the, the Eastern Front and, and Bakhmut with the regiment that we've been working with there. I'm Nicola Alexander and I was the driver in the second convoy from Edinburgh out to Ukraine. Nicola, you were one of these people that maybe Keith is referring to. So it started off with Keith and a couple of friends who were already out there with Ukrainian connections coming over here and maybe roping in some of their friends and, and, and going out with a convoy. And then the word spread because people came back from that and said it was such a necessary thing to do. And I'm right in saying that you then took part in the, the second convoy. Yes, that's right, I did. And I think there's a lot of people out there that, that want to help in some way and just aren't all that sure and kind of what they could do. And for me, I, I had helped out in Errol, sorting out clothing, and my daughter, she did a lot of voluntary work there with school as well. My husband went on the first trip and he came back and had said what an amazing experience it, it was. And he thought that, you know, I would get a lot out of doing it myself. I know Mark very well and I got in touch with him and asked if I could uh, be a part of driving one of the second vehicles. As the time got closer to going, I just felt a little bit more nervous. And I say it was more about, I think it was more about driving on the other side of the road than, than anything else. We drove from here down to Hull on the first day. The, the group that were travelling from Scotland met on the, on the ferry that evening. You can think it's such a small world. There was probably about 12 or 13 of us on the ferry. And in some way, there was a connection with everybody that was there who I hadn't met before. We, we arrived in Rotterdam the next morning, about eight o'clock in the morning. And it was actually just as we were getting onto the ferry when we were handing over our passports, the lady did say, you do realise that you're going to a war zone, don't you? How did that make you feel? A little bit nervous at, at, at the time, but... Because you, you're a mother, you've got, you know, you've got some youngish children, as it were, and what have you, and it is going into a war zone. Yes, you're right, it is. For me, it was just something that I felt I, I really wanted to do. I just wanted to help. And being in this country, for me, it, it just wasn't, I wasn't able to do enough. I just wanted to do more. And so when this opportunity arose, I, I thought, yeah, that's for me. I like an adventure. And I was sure that I wanted to go. And actually, for, for me, the feeling, it just kind of changed as soon as you crossed that border and went into Ukraine. You could see vehicles, um, people still leaving the country. Do you know, you, you could just see the sadness in, in their yeah. faces, must I be, felt. Must be, that must be hellish, seeing people leaving, seeing people fleeing. There's people leaving their homes, leaving their farms, leaving everything behind to get out. We have now safely delivered all 23 vehicles for pickups for peace to the governor's offices in Lviv very humbly and gratefully received and as one of the governor's staff said it's not just supplies you are bringing it's also all the support and motivation to know that there are people who are prepared to drive across Europe to deliver supplies and vehicles to us and uh, that motivation gives us strength. Uh, difficult times and this morning after we dropped the vehicles off we walked past the funeral cortege for three young men who were killed in the last few days in Bakhmut. Uh, we were going through the town square and we stopped the traffic. Eight vehicles uh, behind buses full of mo family mourners. Uh, a lot of people affected uh, directly and also indirectly by losses of loved ones and family at the front and uh, the last post was played as the whole community in the centre of the city stood to attention in silence to respect the fallen.
our supplies will help reduce that everything from combat tourniquets to trauma kit to generators supplies tools and a lot of other medical supplies uh, are being provided as well as the pickups which are used to transport things around at the front We were shown around the, the range at the army base. There was an awful lot of wounded soldiers. We were shown how they threw hand grenades and, and fired missiles and machine guns. Oh, pretty real that, isn't it, to see that? Yeah. Um, unbelievably real, yeah. The thing is, a lot of these soldiers, especially at the beginning of the war, they were, they were training for a week before they were put in the front line. Just a week. So they were... They were civilians. They were, you know, they were every day, whatever they were doing, and, and then they had a week's training to, before going to the front line. Yes, that's right. One week's training um, before they were in the front line. I think now they're able to give them about three or four weeks training before they go to the front line. But it's, yeah, it's just unbelievable that, that this is happening. Um, we also saw the damage. A, a, a drone had landed on, on one of their buildings and just seen the destruction from from one drone was just incredible. We, um, we, we spoke to a lot of the soldiers. Um, we, we had a, a lovely dinner with them that evening. I felt very privileged. I think I was the last one to, to arrive down to dinner and um, opposite was um, a soldier called Yuri. Who, he, he used to be a farmer. This night, I think I was up until about three o'clock in the morning just speaking to these soldiers. There was one guy there, I think he was about 18, who was in, in crutches, and that there was a hand, he, he was on the front line. Again, he'd been training for a week at the training camp. Uh, a hand grenade had landed in, in front of him, which hadn't exploded. And he's a young guy, he hadn't had much training. He, he picked it up, he took it down to the bunker because he thought, you know, we can use this against the Russians. And it exploded in the bunker. It killed seven of his mates. It's just horrific, the things that are happening. There was another soldier that I spoke to. That guy's going to be mentally scarred. That's yeah. That's awful to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this other soldier I, I spoke to, you could just, he just had so much anger about the whole thing. You know, he's, he's lost his, his house. He's, he's managed to get his wife and children out to safety. I think they're now living in, um, in Norway somewhere, but he's fighting in the war and his, his daughter saw her best friend being shot in the head. And, you know, when, when you hear these stories, it, you just, you know, it's devastating. It's devastating to think it's only a pickup drive away. You know, it's not the other side of the world. It's not something that is so far away we don't even need to think about it. What you guys are doing is taking stuff out there in the back of, like this pickup here, for example, I don't mean to be disparaging to whoever donated that, but that doesn't really look like it would make it round the farm. I know it's going to be worked on, etc., but that's going to go out there, and this war zone is only a drive away in that pickup. This is only 15 hours' drive from the channel, this war. So it's not a continent away, it's very real, and uh, the gratitude and fellowship of the Ukrainians uh, for these vehicles and the supplies is tremendous. You know, it's very moving. I get very emotional about it. They're so grateful to the support that we, we give. The, uh, the Chief of Staff from the 24th Brigade that we've we uh, been very involved in and delivered the first 100 uh, vehicles to said to me, you know, you're bringing a lot of supplies and you're bringing the vehicles, but even more important than that, you're bringing a morale boost and a motivation there that all our soldiers can see and our humanitarian workers and our civilians can see that they're not forgotten and that there are people who are prepared to drive across Europe to help them. You, you're getting a bit emotional about that, Keith, but yeah. I, I, can, I can totally see why. Well, that, that's right. And I'm sure Nicola would, would echo my sentiments. When we drive from the border into to Lviv or to the, 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 uh, the, the compound, there are people stopped by the side of the road, you know, saluting us. There are cars on the other side of the road pulled across 
in deference to us and respect. And, and that gratitude is, is echoed all the way through Ukraine, right to the, the, the local government who, who are delighted to have some of the vehicles to help with their humanitarian aids and, and helping their civilians as well. Tell us about what the pickups are and what it means to them, what they're doing with them and why it's so important that they receive pickups and things that, and you know the other things that go with them yeah well they're used for a range of purposes um uh, humanitarian purposes some of the organizations were involved with are humanitarian a lot go to the military and they're rescuing civilians from the front as the front moves backwards and forwards they're taking wounded back uh, to the field hospital so there they're very much saving lives one of the things that's been donated for 30 pounds is a combat tourniquet which can save uh, the blood loss, uh, it can be put on with one, one hand and uh, can save a life and then the people are taken back more quickly to the field hospitals uh, in the background. They're also involved in um, uh, taking teams that are clearing mines because uh, almost 20% of the farmland now is denied to farming uh, because of either munitions or minefields or the war going on there. And that's going to have a major effect, continuing effect on food price inflation and food security uh, with that 20%. The uh, other things that's been used, for example, uh, some were used in helping people at the Kakova Dam recently in, in bringing, uh, you, all of you will have seen the flooding there and the de desperately uh, dreadful uh, eco-crisis that, that that's caused. Uh, I've been on some of those fields that were, were underwater and some of the best soils in the world there and it's really a crime against humanity that that's now been ruined and a lot of that topsoil will have been washed out in the Black Sea. Uh, th these sort of operations are there. They're also uh, used for drone units and uh, some of them have um, uh, been used for mounting anti-missile uh, defences on the back of to, to try and stop. And the, the air defences there have been very uh, effective, but, you know, targeting of missiles, a few still get through and, and, and kill civilians. And uh, the, the, uh, the usage of these vehicles is, is very widespread. And uh, we know that now that the 160, they don't last forever. Um, Can I and ask about that? that that's, you've delivered 160 vehicles now. How many of those are still functioning, do you reckon? Uh, most of them are lasting over three months, but in that time they're doing fantastic work. And I think all of us have, as we've driven there, particularly as we've got near the border or driving behind the police con uh, escort into Lviv, have been with our hands on the wheel thinking, whose hands will be on the wheel next and what will they be facing? And they're facing these dangers and, and this uh, these horrific situations for us as well as themselves because there's no doubt in my mind that they are fighting for democracy and, and the rights of people throughout Europe. One of the motivations that I have for doing this is I have three young granddaughters and I want them to grow up in a, in a, in a world where the rule of law and, and uh, uh, international uh, regulations and, and uh, uh, civility is, is obeyed. I grew up in, during the Cold War and I can still remember what it was like in those days. And I don't want our children and grandchildren to have to live through that. So these people are fighting for all of us and uh, we, we, we owe it to them with all the, the, the horrible things that they're having, going through to help them in any way we can. And this is a very, pickups for peace is a very real way of helping them, whether it's doing a small amount of money to help towards a tank of diesel or a shovel uh, that can go in the back of it or, or donating a vehicle uh, in itself. There's so many uh, um, difficult and doom and gloom stories in the industry and, and the farming industry at the moment that here is a really good news story of the community coming together and making a real difference and I can assure you saving lives that there's no doubt we talk to to the people who've got these vehicles at the front as, as we deliver the next thing and they say you know how many lives have been saved by these vehicles and it's a, it's a really positive step uh, that the whole community is engaging in. And I think uh, Scotland and, and obviously parts of England that we're getting the vehicles from as well can be very proud of, of what they've done and, and Scotland is certainly punching above its weight in terms of supporting the Ukraine. Having had a, a tour with a guide around the beautiful city of Lviv, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, to tell us of the history and the difficult times that have already occurred in the previous centuries. We are now travelling back by foot through the border at Medica to get um, our air travel from Krakow and Jeshov back to the UK, walking through Medica, the same 
crossing point that we all saw on the news in the early days of the war that was mobbed by people fleeing the conflict. And as we walked through today, we thought of the, the young mother with two children carrying all her worldly possessions in two or three bags, leaving her husband behind to fight at the front and not knowing if she would ever see him again. And a truly humbling experience. Everybody has found a roller coaster of emotions on this journey, but know they are doing a fantastic job in terms of helping the people of Ukraine in the brave fight for us all. I'm very proud, and I hope anyone listening to this is, I'm very proud that you guys are doing this on behalf of, shall we say it's on behalf of Scottish farmers? It's everyone that's donating, everyone that's supporting, but, you know, in a way, you're flying the flag for Scottish farmers out there, and I think that's a wonderful thing to be doing. That's great, whether you're putting in a fiver or a tenner. The more we can do now, the more lives will be saved, and the sooner this dreadful war will finish and we can get back to rebuilding. Because one of the problems, I think, in Ukraine will be, as you've alluded to, Monty, is, is the, the mental health problems that will be there from the front, from the civilians who've been there every night, uh, you know, having missile alerts and being woken up almost like a, an 18-month sleep deprivation uh, exercise and, and experiment. A lot of these farmers, they've got a lot of stuff in their sheds that could be of huge use out there. They're in desperate need of, of tyres. One, one of the pickups just had tyres alone in it. They go through tyres incredibly quickly. The amount of kind of shrapnel on the roads out there. I mean, tyres are being destroyed constantly. We also... There's one thing taking a, work, a pickup out, like this one, but actually they need things to keep the pickups going as well. Tyres and whatever else. Absolutely, yeah. I would love people listening to this podcast to think about that and, and try and do this because, you know, as we all know, there's you be, things are lying around in sheds and things are in workshops and whatever. Are you really going to need it? Are you really going to use it? In Ukraine, it'll be used. It's the sort of things that most farmers are walking past in their workshop every day and can make such a difference uh, on, on the front line. Some of the things that we take for granted are desperately needed there in a short supply. And, and I think, you know, if you're looking at your pickup in, in, in the, um, the yard, we've taken some pickups out there. We want ones that work, but um, I, I took a, a, an, an old Land Rover Defender, which didn't have an MOT previously, that was donated by the Milnes from this, uh, uh, this county of Fife. And um, I, I wondered whether it would get, get across the Scottish border, let alone the Ukrainian border. But... As it, as it cleared its sinuses, as it drove through Scotland to the ferry and then through the, the lowlands, it got better and better. It was like a fine wine. Uh, and by the time it got to the border, it was, it was really going well. So um, even the ones that have been sitting around on the farm or just driving around on the farm, they give a consideration to, to let it, letting us have them. And I think the important thing is also that we are a charity, so you can gift aid that. And obviously, it can, uh, there's a number of ways that they, these can be worked through the accounts to, to make sure that uh, it's uh, giving the best value to, to both ends of the, of the, of the, uh, the deal. It seems like a, a big thing to give away a vehicle, a, a, a perfectly good vehicle or a vehicle that's got life in it. But, you know, you maybe have something that's been written down in the accounts. You maybe have something that actually on your books is now worth nothing and it owes you nothing. And you're talking about a Land Rover Defender. Just, just give us a bit more about that. So it's not just... We're, the charity is called Pickups for Peace, but you're looking for what? Any four by four? All, all, all four by fours are, are very useful, and um, you know that we've taken a wide range of vehicles across there. Some of them we've uh, painted green and camouflage, and some have, have gone in their, their natural colours. So yeah, ha have a think. And it's also uh, a number of you could get together and put a thousand in, and we can buy the pickup for you because there's, there's some pickups up there. I, would, I, I hope we're not uh, by uh, buying them all, we're putting the, the, the market price up but uh, so far that doesn't seem to have happened but uh, certainly uh, band together and if you each put a, a thousand in again that can be gift aided and uh, we can buy a pickup on your behalf and take it across. Crass as it might sound I want to slightly move away from the, the human aspect of it because we've got Keith Dawson and Keith has been renowned over many years as an agronomist um, figure with SAC and farming out in Ukraine so, Keith, you, you of all people know or knew or are aware of the massive potential out there. And 
and, and what's being lost and what's being lost from the food chain. You're, you're uh, as much as anyone, can, can bring us up to speed on, on that. Yes, well, I remember back in 2005 when Mark and I and um, uh, George Taylor of, uh, of uh, Tayside... Yeah, so um, we've, we've, we've referred to Mark a bit in this podcast. That's Mark Laird, who was, is in the Central Plains group with you and is one of the founders of Pickups for Peace. Yeah. That, that's yeah. correct, yeah. We're out there digging in the snow, scraping the snow off and, and digging the first soil samples from the land we were looking at. And we saw in the west of Ukraine thousands upon thousands of, of hectares which were just uh, going to rack and ruin after the, um, the dissolution of the, uh, the, the, uh, the centralised farms and the Soviet rule, the collective farms, which had just been uh, given to each villager one or two hectares from the 20,000 or 30,000 that a collective farm might be. And some had been tilled for a few years, but gradually that had run down. And uh, the soils are, are fantastic. What Mark and I spotted uh, in those years, we, were, we developed successful businesses in, in Poland, uh, but the opportunities for expansion were, were not there. Uh, we saw this juxtaposition of excellent soils, uh, not the best soils in Ukraine, but as good as anything in Scotland at, at our broth on the Golden Mile, and also the uh, juxtaposition with the rainfall from the Carpathian Mountains, whereas in the east of Ukraine, you're talking about great soils, but maybe only uh, in the old money, 12 inches of rainfall. Here we had 36 inches of rainfall, and we could grow potatoes without irrigation there. So there was also uh, almost a moral imperative to, to try and do something here uh, and uh, develop the uh, and regenerate uh, the agriculture. And we built up uh, uh, a business of uh, from 90 hectares of of uh, potatoes to start with. I remember uh, going to my bank manager to borrow my initial uh, 60K for an investment um, telling him I was putting an extension up. I didn't tell him the extension was going to be in Ukraine, but uh, he, did, he didn't need to know that. Um, uh, and, and we were successful in that first, first year with 90 hectares and we built up to uh, uh, a business uh, with acquisition which was uh, 200,000 hectares uh, and uh, the largest regenerative farming business in, in, in Europe and then we, we sold that after launching it on the stock exchange and uh, we set up Central Plains Group uh, which has got basically a, a model of um, growing potatoes and uh, taking them to make starch and also biopolymers for things like biodegradable plastic and other feedstock for um, uh, industrial processes in a very green and, and circular economy. So we're looking to the future there, and Ukraine has a future. The people are amazing, um, the soils are amazing, and agriculture will be very important. And we certainly in Central Plains Group want to play a key role in that, in the rehabilitation. And uh, we, we believe that uh, Scotland has a role here in helping to rebuild uh, Ukrainian agriculture as well through world famous uh, institutes like the James Hutton Institute and, and SAC as well as Central Plains Group. Just coming in on that, again, from the farming point of view, because you know you have many years and you've been advising farmers in Scotland. You know you're, you are a renowned ag agronomist, but you sort of, for want of a better way of putting it, you kind of bet your shirt on Ukraine. You went out there and you you, you invested, and it grew and. And you saw the potential, and you've, you've grown something out there. You can sense your anger when you, when you talk about it like that. Well, back in 2022, as, you, as many farmers will, will realise, February the 25th, that's the sort of uh, the timing in the, in the annual cycle of farming that you're looking to, the decisions to plant. Uh, what are you going to plant uh, this, this, that year? We had a big decision to make in Central Plains Group. Uh, should we plant at all? Who was going to harvest it? Would it be the Russians harvesting our crop at the end of the day? It took us about five minutes as a management team to come to a decision that we had to plant in an act of faith and defiance, faith in the local team and a, and a defiant uh, gesture towards the Russians. As time went on, our incredible local team there, showing that the spirit of the Ukrainians, uh, brought that, that uh, crop through to a successful harvest. And uh, during COVID and then the war, we, we built... Um, uh, a starch factory, starch processing factory, which is producing some of the highest quality starch for biopolymers and other uses in, in Europe. So it's a real testament to, to the Ukrainians. And there will be, the war will end and there will be opportunities in, in uh, Ukraine again, and particularly in Lviv Oblast, which is in the West, where a lot of businesses are, have moved and, uh, and where we farmed and have farmed successfully for almost 20 years. 
and we will need it all because every every morning there's another 150,000 net mouths to feed in the world and uh, you know food security uh, and the tightness of supply and demand is still there ukraine has a powerful role to play and uh, certainly scotland has a has a, a role in partnership with ukraine to help build that that is really interesting to put it in the the, the terms that scotland has a partnership again maybe from a farming point of view you almost think of people and and you can't speak about the ukrainians like this given they're in a war zone but you think of people over the seas as being your competitors but let's look at what we've got here with in terms of you mentioned james hutton you mentioned sac you know we've got knowledge to trade as well we've not just got to worry about whether they can sell potatoes more cheaply than we have or whatever we've got expertise and knowledge that are valuable to people all over the all over the globe and particularly in rebuilding somewhere like ukraine well, that's right. Yeah, 4th of July, we have Arable Scotland up at Dundee. T- uh, in early August, we have Potatoes in Practice. So Scotland is a world leader in terms of its technology. And our success, I suppose, in Ukraine was bringing this Scottish technology and using the, the soils and the rainfall of, of Ukraine and, the, and the, the, uh, the motivated workforce we found out there to develop a, a successful business. As I say, it became the, the largest regenerative farming operation in Europe in, in the days before we knew what re- regenerative farming farming was, but we built the soil structure up and we built the, the organic matter up in the soils uh, by using sound principles based on uh, uh, centuries of, of, of uh, expertise in Scotland, uh, back to the, 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 uh, the founder of geology and, and a farmer himself, James Hutton. Yeah, we, we've, we've touched on James Hutton in previous episodes with Denise Daly-Walton of the Nature Friendly Farming Network, and I think if anyone's listening and wants to maybe go back to that episode, that was a really enthusiastic discussion about that. I want to bring in Nicola just back to the, the pickup thing. And we're standing beside a pickup, Nicola. Are you going to drive this one out? I'm not sure I'm actually going to drive that one out, um, Monty, but I'm, I'm definitely hoping to, to go back in September. Would you encourage people that, that you're talking about September? And I know for, for security reasons, there's never a sort of talk of a convoy leaving on a certain date or arriving on a certain date. I, I, I get all of that. But we're talking at the moment about September are you looking for donations? Are you quite happy to, to take donations here? Are you encouraging other people? Absolutely. Uh, donations are, are always welcome. I'm more than happy for, for people to come and donate here or, or if they get in touch with someone from Pickups for Peace, they will um, get back to you as to where your kind of nearest destination would be to drop goods off. But yeah, we're, we're, we're constantly looking for, for more things. And that's all on Pickups for Peace website? Yes, it is indeed. There's a, a links there. If you um, you do hatch, hashtag uh, Pickups for Peace, you'll get a lot of information there. Or uh, email Pickups for Peace at memus.com. That's M-E-M-U-S dot com. And we, we, we will stick all of that in the show notes to this and you'll find links. And we shall certainly use that hashtag when we're promoting this episode. So look out for it. Just one last thing before we kind of wrap up about supporters You've landed a corporate supporter in, is it Trinity Grain, Keith? Yes, that's correct. Um, we've been very ha- happy to be engaged with them and they've been uh, good donators and have donated funds for a number of vehicles. And I say back in the early days, last June, before Pickups for Peace had been set up, Caledonian Marts helped to seed, along with Central Plains Group, the initial three vehicles that got us all thinking. So, uh, you know, corporate sponsors are very welcome or individual sponsors uh, just giving a, f- a few pounds uh, towards uh, a shovel or a combat tourniquet, for example, which would, would save a life. If you're listening to this and you want to get involved, you want to help, or you know someone that would, could, should support, please pass on the message. Please pass on the podcast. So, massive thanks. Massive thanks to everything that you guys do, Keith and team. Massive thanks to, to Nicola for going out there and for obviously being so keen to encourage others and for looking like you're going again and massive thanks for speaking to us today thank you monty thank you very much before we finish this episode i'll thank again our sponsors gillespie mcandrew bail ingram laurie and symington none of this is possible without them and as a reminder in case you haven't listened pickups for peace was one of the ideas that was put forward to us in our previous episode, our 150th episode of On Farm. We were at the Highland Show asking people to pitch a pod. 
i.e. tell us about something that they thought was worth recording as a podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, which was the result of that. And of course, we don't just want you to listen to the episode, we don't just want you to be aware of Pickups for Peace, if at all possible, we would love it if you could support them. So do look for the link in the show notes, along with this episode, for how you can support Pickups for Peace in any way possible. Donations of cash, tools, vehicles, anything from a ratchet strap to a shovel to a bucket, all the things that we might have, even lying around in a farm steading, we might take for granted, we might never use, but they could be very useful in Ukraine. And I'll just finish now by reminding you again, as I always do, on farm, these podcasts are made by our team at Seen and Heard PR and Marketing. And with that, that's it from me. Bye for now.